Hello, I'm Cliff Bailey from Aston University in Birmingham in the UK. And in the next few minutes, we're going to consider the key classes of anti-diabetic drugs, and in particular, how do they work? We're going to focus on type 2 diabetes, and we're going to initially uh, think about managing hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes in general and how it fits into some of the other problems that are associated with type 2 diabetes. Then we'll consider the oral agents and then we'll consider the injectable agents and we'll try to put them all into some context. So first of all, after the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, it's not just glucose control we have to consider. We also have to consider cardiovascular risk and we have to consider the other um, comorbidities that need to be managed or uh, prevent or deferred. So the aim of treatment is to try and produce glycemic control that's as close to normal as possible because this will reduce the microvascular risk of nephropathy, retinopathy and the neural diseases that are associated with glucotoxicity. Then obviously we want to reduce macrovascular risk and so quite independently in most cases there will be control of lipids and blood pressure. And then we'll need to manage the comorbidities, obesity, depression, fatty liver and so forth, as well as of course the standard um, microvascular complications. So bearing this all in mind, let's have a look at what actually uh, we're trying to deal with in type 2 diabetes. So we have multiple causes for the development of hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes. These involve insulin resistance, inadequate insulin production and secretion, but also many other problems as well. So if we just go around this circle of issues, we can see that the liver produces too much glucose. The muscle doesn't get enough of that glucose because, of course, we've got insulin resistance. We often see excess adipose tissue, which also contributes to the pro-inflammatory state. And because there's more glucose being filtered through the kidney, the kidney tends to adapt by actually reabsorbing more. On the other side of the equation, we can see that there's inadequate insulin production, there's usually also an excess of glucagon produced and there are various defects associated with the incretin effect. That's how uh, hormones from the intestine are able to bolster the effect of the pancreas during uh, meal consumption. We can also see that there's an altered microbiome and there are various autonomic changes in the control of glucoregulation. So our first up approach to the management of the hyperglycemia is lifestyle. This is diet, exercise, um, health education and weight control. All of those recommendations that we offer to people that we don't follow ourselves. Then we have got metformin as usually the preferable first line oral agent. This is an agent which is able to counter the action of insulin resistance. It works in some extent um, dependently on insulin. You've got to have some present, but also a number of its actions are insulin independent. It is able to reduce hepatic glucose production. It is able to have a small effect on improving the uptake of glucose and its oxidation by muscle. And it also has an important effect on the intestine to increase anaerobic glucose metabolism, which is in fact where the um, risk of lactate comes from. Important message for metformin is to make sure there's adequate renal function, consider reducing the dose when the EGFR falls below 60 and stop when you get to an EGFR of 30. Then, of course, if you need more insulin, you could stimulate insulin secretion with sulfonylureas or meglitonides. Sulfonylureas tend to be the longer-acting meglitonides, the prandial insulin releases. Um, we've got pioglitazone, which is a PPAR gamma agonist, which is able to act firstly on adipose tissue to increase adipogenesis and to increase lipogenesis, but in making new adipocytes, these are insulin sensitive and they take away ectopic fat from other tissues. And so there is a risk of weight gain here, but there isn't a risk of hypoglycemia, which there is, for example, with agents which stimulate insulin secretion, namely the sulfonylureas and the glitonides. Then we've got the incretins. We've got the 
um, oral ones, which are the DPP-4 inhibitors. These are able to prolong the life of endogenous GLP-1 to increase the incretin effect. Or we can use GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are agents that are injected and are able to um, not only enhance glucose-induced insulin secretion, but also suppress uh, glucagon production. And additionally, they have neural effects to promote satiety, which of course helps their weight loss element, and also to delay gastric emptying. Um, we have uh, alpha-glucosidase inhibitors like acabose, which are able to slow down the digestion of complex carbohydrate in the intestine, and this gives us yet another option here for um, slowing down that postprandial excursion of glucose. And I've mentioned on the slide that metformin and incretins, of course, are also acting on the intestine. And then turning to the kidney, we have the SGLT2 inhibitors. These are the glucosuric agents which are able to um, suppress the reabsorption of glucose from the proximal tubule and create maybe 70, 80, 90 grams of glucose out in the urine, which of course is not only able to lower hyperglycemia in an insulin-independent way, but also lowers um, weight through the loss of calories and uh, may create an osmotic diuresis, which I suspect contributes to its a blood pressure lowering effect and has been shown, of course, like metformin and GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists to have potentially beneficial effects on uh, major adverse cardiac events. And there's even some evidence that pioglitazone can indeed benefit um, some major adverse cardiac events, but does run the risk, of course, of uh, heart failure because of the edema element to its action. So if we are unable to achieve the glycemic control we want with each or all of those agents, we can turn to insulin. Insulin is able to affect many of the uh, defects that occur in type 2 diabetes. But what we have been able to see here is that the hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes is the result of multiple factors and therefore we do need to look to multiple therapies in order to get that glucose level back to as close to normal as possible as soon as possible in order to defer or prevent the development of microvascular complications and contribute to the long-term reduction in macrovascular complications. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed it.